Welcome to episode 71 of AA Beyond Belief, the podcast. I'm your host, John S. In this episode, I'll speak with Chris Finan, author of Drunks in American History. The book covers alcoholism and its treatment from America's beginning all the way through the 21st century. Good morning, Chris. How you doing? Hi, John. Very good. Well, I want to thank you again for agreeing to um, come on the podcast and also for contributing um, a few chapters to um, AA Beyond Belief. I read your book and I, I really enjoyed it and I learned a lot. There were some little details in the history that I had never known before and, and I, I was I was really amazed that you could get that that information. Um, anyway, I, I thought maybe a good place to start is if you could tell us about your background and what led you to write the book to begin with. Sure. I guess it's a combination of factors. First of all, I'm you know from a family with a long uh, history of alcoholism starting as far back or possibly even further back as my great-grandfather and um, my grandfather, my grandfather's um, two brothers, his sister, my dad, and me. I was uh, still drinking um, actively when I quit my job as a newspaper reporter in a small town in Ohio and um, came to New York to study history. And um and I drank through most of most of graduate school, but um, so I had those those twin passions, drinking and history. <laughs> and um, when I did get sober in the eighties, um, when I was in the middle of my my dissertation, uh, I had a conversation with my academic advisor, and of course I hadn't been um, too eager to acknowledge my alcoholism. Um, in graduate school, but I finally felt I had a couple of years under my belt and I felt I could talk to him about it. And I told him and he, you know, almost instantly said, well, you must write a history of alcoholism. Mm. <laughs> and I said, I was at that time mired in a, in a book that was going to take me almost 20 years to, to write from the dissertation stage to finally getting it published. I couldn't think of anything uh, beyond that book, but it did sound like Maybe it was a good idea. His thought was that as somebody in recovery, um, you know, that I would have some unique uh, perspectives to add to the story. So I, I finished the first book and um, started a career in civil liberties. Uh, I work now as the executive director of the National Coalition Against Censorship. So I've been doing this work for about 30 years, about um about as long as I've been sober. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so the second book was about civil liberties. And when that book was done, I naturally turned to, to this subject. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea what, what I was really looking at. At that point, I um, only read AA histories, um, knew about as much about the history of alcoholism as they, you know, they revealed. And so there were, of course, references to the Washingtonians mm -hmm. in the early 19th century but that that was it so i was a clean slate when i started okay that's interesting i i was kind of a clean slate before i read your book and <laughs> to a certain <laughs> extent i read i read oh some of the histories um that's um published by aa world services and i've read ernest kurtz's book not god so i have that kind of a background in history and i've been a member of alcoholics anonymous for oh, almost 30 years now so i've got th that kind of a background um, but I also I also love history, and what I really liked about your book grabbed me from the very beginning because you introduced it by um, telling the story of John Adams and his son Charles and the doctor that got involved, Dr. Benjamin Rush, who's one of my favorite characters from the American Revolution. And what I found interesting about um, beginning the book that way is you immediately went into two themes. Number one, the shame and stigma associated with being an alcoholic and the idea that this is perhaps a disease that's beyond the control of the sufferer. And it seems like, you know, that seems to be a recurring theme from that time all the way to the present 
present time is kind of how I, uh, what I kind of got from reading your book. But can you kind of talk a little bit in more detail about what was going on with Dr. Benjamin Rush and his, and how he was treating Charles and that whole relationship and how and why you might have started the book with that story? Well, I uh, I wanted to to pin down the point in time um, more than anything else and to uh, establish you know that this is a this is an original problem of American history mm-hmm. that hasn't really gotten much attention. And, um, and the story is heartbreaking. Uh, you know, the, um, John Adams, when he, he discovers that his son is an alcoholic, renounces him and calls him a beast, um, and a rake and, um, uh, cuts him out of his life. And his wife, Abigail is a little more sympathetic. Um, but she also tries to, sober Charles up with lectures about his responsibilities and upholding the family name. And by that time, it's too late. He's already um, very close to death and he dies at the A in his early thirties, shortly after, you know, he's seen his mom. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I was, I was really um, moved by the tragedy of, of the situation, but it also um, was important because this was a period um, in the late 18th century when drinking was um, increasing dramatically in the United States and becoming um, a problem that uh, the country would spend the next two centuries trying uh, to deal with. The temperance movement begins just a few years later in a, in a small town in upstate New York and um, soon grows to be a, a, an enormous popular movement uh, that continues really right through to the passage of uh, prohibition uh, in, uh, you know, the early 20th century. So, so I was doing those two things. I was, you know, using a story to, you know, to mark a place in history that I think people are unaware of. I, people mm-hmm. are, you know, don't have a sense of alcoholism being a problem that early in our history. Right. It's not it's not something that's, you know, covered when, in your basic history 101 class or something like that. I I remember um, you know, reading the book John Adams and and um that being touched upon. So, I was kind of familiar with the story, but um I I I really liked that you you started the book that way. But also, then you went into um looking at a subject that I'm I'm interested in and becoming more interested in is alcoholism among the Native Americans and you talked about um, handsome Lake and what he was doing and his efforts to help his people, which seemed to be working at the time. And it all evolved around kind of changing the culture. Uh, if I'm, if I'm understanding that right of, um, his people, um, is, am I understanding that? His yeah, approach? that's, a, that's exactly, that's exactly right. Um, mm-hmm. almost simultaneously with, you know, the death of Charles Adams is, you know, the, the, Story of Handsome Lake getting sober. Um, you know, it's just in the last years of, of the 18th century. Uh, his people have been reduced. He was a, uh, a member of the Seneca tribe of the <clears throat> Iroquois nation, which at one time had really dominated parts of um, New York and Pennsylvania. Um, but by the end of the American Revolution, had been um, confined on small reservations and had suffered. Uh, enormous losses in population and had suffered terribly from drinking and and handsome lake who had once been a great warrior had been uh, reduced by that time uh, to a point where he was but skin and yellow skin and bones he said Mm -hmm. and he gets sober he's almost on the point of death you know there are certainly parallels between his um his moment of revelation in Bill Wilson's, uh, he is, he is literally, you know, days within, uh, dying of his illness. And he has a religious vision, um, a spiritual vision of, um, several, uh, middle-aged, beautifully dressed Indians coming to him as messengers from the great creator. And the message of the great creator is that he needs to lead a religious revival among his people to save them from uh, from the perils that they faced, and uh, the core uh, one of the core principles, and certainly the starting point of that, 
is that he must tell his people that they have to stop drinking. Mm -hmm. um, that drinking is destroying them. And, um, and he awakes from, from this vision and um, begins to carry the message almost immediately, although he's still too weak um, uh, for several months. He has several more visions. Uh, and he in, uh, soon, rather almost immediately, is recognized as a, as a prophet by the, the Seneca and other uh, tribes of the Iroquois. And he begins a, the religious revival that he's called the, to on and um, significantly sobers. Over the next 15 years before his death, he significantly sobers uh, his people and yeah. establishes a religion that in fact lives long into the 20th century and, and may still be practiced in some, uh, in some Seneca communities. Well, that's interesting. And another, and on that note, later in the book, you talked about um, the peyote religion. And um, I, I don't know where that went, if that's still going on now, but it seemed like um, the, the Native Americans were using peyote and they made a religion out of it and they were succeeding in um, in combating alcoholism, you know, drunkenness wasn't a problem, and uh, but the um, I think the government wasn't wanting to allow this. They saw it as a narcotic, but it seemed like it was it was working. And I'm wondering, did what happened to that? Did is that tradition carrying on to this day? Because um, I know there's it's still a huge problem in that community. Yeah, uh, to tell you the truth, I don't know exactly the status of. Um uh, of the peyote religion today. Mm -hmm. uh, I do know that after the, that there were efforts to suppress it, um, because of its use of, a uh, of what was considered an intoxicant. Yeah. And is it marijuana? Is that what it is? No, it's, <clears throat> it's actually, it's, it's a different drug and, um, it's an, but it is natural. It is, you know, something that is produced by the earth. It wasn't, a, it, it wasn't mm -hmm. manufactured. And it had its great power was um, that it allowed its followers to find an outlet for um, a positive outlet for a lot of negative feelings uh, that they had uh, because the problems of the Native Americans certainly only got worse over time. Yeah. And it had a um, it became a centerpiece of this new religion um, that eventually was protected. Uh, you know, they, they received court protection. The Supreme Court upheld the use of peyote mm -hmm. in, for religious purposes under the First Amendment, mm -hmm. uh, the right to you know, practice your own religion. But it's a very good question, you know, about the status of it today. I, um, I got to well, say, I, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I was kind of interested in that because um, I'm, I'm becoming more and more interested in that, in that culture, um, um, understanding the, the nature of the problem in that community. Um, but anyway, that, yeah, I, th I found that interesting that it wasn't just the, it wasn't just a substance anyway. I, I think it was the whole, um, oh, the, the principles that they, that they were trying to practice and that the substance, the peyote was just, you know, a ceremonial that was just, that, that was, that, that, that wasn't the basis of, I think, what was working for them. It was that whole, I think, changing their culture and, and establishing some sort of a, I guess you could call a program or, or some, something to follow. Um, well, and, and establishing sobriety. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it was it was absolutely you know, peyotes did not drink. That was That's a card right. that was a cardinal principle. So mm -hmm. um, that you know, at least gave them some foundation to begin to make you know larger changes in their lives. It also you know during the ceremony itself, it it provided some uh, freedom for uh, men who were largely stoic and women, mm -hmm. um, and held their emotions inside to to let those emotions come out, to oh, confess right. things, to confess things that, um, they had held, uh, secret. Um, so it, you know, it filled the, it, it filled a spiritual need yeah. uh, for those people. And, um, in, you know, in the same way that, um, pet handsome Lake reviving, you know, the, the rituals that had uh, fallen away in his time, mm -hmm. you know, brought religion back to his people. Yeah. And you know a common theme of of, of all of these um, societies and different ways of, of of approaching the problem is that there was always that connection, that personal connection, and telling of stories. And when we get into the um, temperance movement, I guess um, the Washingtonians um, that that I had a 
that I, I want to read that part of your book again because there seems to be a lot of stuff that's going on simultaneous. A lot of these societies were popping up, it seemed, and um, I had a hard time remembering and distinguishing one from the other. But it seemed like they all did have. I was impressed. Put it this way, Chris. I was impressed that all of these societies were a lot more progressive and liberal than I had ever imagined. Um, that, you know, I always imagine them to be um, more dogmatic in a way. And it seemed like that, that especially the Washingtonians really seemed to be all about sharing personal experience and trying to, you know, make a difference. Um, yeah. And the Washingtonians, what I found interesting too is that, um, the demise seemed to be that, um, through this temperance movement, there were a lot of people that were really fascinated by the stories that these drunks would tell. So they would gather around, they listened to these really interesting stories, and they would all take this pledge, whether they had a problem or not. And then after a while, those that really didn't have a problem with alcohol, they kind of got bored with it all. Um, and so the numbers dwindled. But those that were um, alcoholics, they were still interested in the stories and kind of kept the movement going. But I wonder if you can kind of help me understand a little bit better about what that whole period of time, which I guess would have been like the 1800s up into the um, early 20th century when you had the the temperance movement and all these different societies. Um, uh, it was just really interesting stuff. Well, um, it is hard to, especially for recovering alcoholics like us, to um, – feel any sympathy for the temperance movement <laughs> because so much of it seemed to be, you know, targeted at um, negative stereotypes about, right. you know, alcoholics. And um, and it didn't really seem to be about helping alcoholics, mm -hmm. at least in the early years of the temperance movement. There was much more focus on helping alcoholics than than later when prohibition became yeah. kind of, the uh, you know, the the target and when. So, um, but even in the early period, there was this major difference. The, the ministers and um, even some of the doctors who were advocates of um, the temperance movement, their focus was on keeping people from becoming alcoholics and not about helping, helping alcoholics. The alcoholics, as you pointed out earlier, were largely, you know, forgotten people. They were, it was assumed, uh, more or less that alcoholism was incurable. And um, so the best thing that you could do was kind of isolate those people from the rest of society, let them die off, um, persuade uh, and, and let society go forward as a temperate, you know, as a temperate culture and, and country. Um, so that's why the, the Washingtonians were so important that, you know, the Washingtonians even though they became a national movement that attracted um, many different types of people, and as you say, including um, people who didn't drink much, uh, certainly weren't alcoholics. Mm -hmm. um, the core, the leadership, were people with alcohol problems, mm -hmm. and they, you know, they absolutely amazed their their fellow countrymen by demonstrating that people could recover, and um, that all you, you know, that by going out and, and extending your hand to a man who had fallen in the street, helping him um, get healthy, helping him find work, um, and then um, seeing this miraculous change in which he became a um, an active and productive citizen of the country. This was just this this was the biggest news in America in the early 19th century, mm -hmm. and it, it's why it generated so much excitement, and it spread so quickly to almost every uh, every community in the country, mm -hmm. and it seemed like, you know, they were on the verge of curing the problem of alcohol once and for all, but as you point out, the Washingtonians weren't able to maintain that kind of uh, dynamism, and, and it, became a, it became a craze, a fad um, that faded uh, almost as quickly as it began. And, you know, nobody was the worse except for the alcoholics who had been, um, who had been coming to meetings and sharing their experience and getting help. You know, the decline of the Washingtonians was a tragedy for them, but, but it left important, um, contributions. It, it convinced increasingly, uh, uh doctors that, 
uh, alcoholism could be treated. Mm -hmm. and, it, and there began to be um, institutions established, largely private in the beginning, but by the end of the 19th century, public institutions being established um, to help alcoholics, to get them out of the mental hospitals, to get them out of the jails. Uh, so that the, the 19th century is really a period of progress you know, in the fight against alcoholism that, you know, was largely reversed as a result of, um, of prohibition when everybody thought, you know, that would take care of the problem. And that infrastructure of um, institutions to help alcoholics shut down. Yeah. Just and those institutions were actually pretty compassionate, weren't they? They were, a lot of them were pretty nice places. Um, well, yeah, some of them were. I, it depended kind of on the philosophy of, you know, the doctor who was heading them up. Um, some doctors, you know, really believed that military style discipline was necessary in order to shape up alcoholics. But there were a lot of very compassionate um, leaders and um, who were not alcoholics, um, you know, and um, but who were able to help many people uh, find sobriety, uh, you know, long before AA was established. Mm -hmm. And then also, I think it was around this time, and um, and correct me if I'm wrong on the time timeline, but the the, the so-called gold cure, um, and to me that kind of seemed like it was like one of the very first um, treatment center um, conglomerates, <laughs> um, where he came up with this idea, this this potion, I guess, um, and I, I I and I guess it didn't even have gold in it. I don't know, but anyway. It, it seemed to be working. And what I found really interesting about this is, um, I don't know how well it was really working, but his business was certainly growing and all these, all these, um, Keeley centers were sprouting up all over the place and, um, a lot of money was being made and, but people were getting better, it seemed. And, um, but the scientists were looking at it with some skepticism that, um, uh, this wasn't working. And then later I learned that, um, this is what the, the, and I didn't know anything about this new thought movement before I read your book, but, um, people were looking at that as, okay, it wasn't really the substance that these people were taking, but it was the power within them to think that it was helping them that was really doing it. And that kind of moved us into the new thought, um, movement. And could you tell me if I'm understanding that correctly? And then I think you also connected that with, kind of like the birth of psychology in treating alcoholism. Am I getting that yeah. right? Yeah, no, um, exactly so. The, uh, the gold cure uh, of Dr. Leslie Keeley um, became another fad uh, and um, attracted large numbers of people, maybe as many as 100,000 people, to clinics, uh, franchise, franchise clinics, just like you said. It mm -hmm. was you know big business around the country. Um, in the 1890s, and okay. for the decade of decade of the 1890s, uh, well, for the uh, for the for at least first several years of the 1890s, before the um, Great Depression of 1894, um, it was very booming business. And the secret to it, uh, although Leslie Keeley claimed it was this gold cure that he invented, was that it was the first time that large numbers of alcoholics were brought into treatment in one place. Interesting. Okay. And um, they went to these Keeley clinics for uh, three or four weeks. And it, there they discovered other men who had the same problem. It was almost entirely men. Mm -hmm. Other men who had the same problem that they did. And um, this immediately acted to reduce the shame that they felt and the isolation they felt. They were many cases they were um, meeting judges and ministers and lawyers and people of high social class um, and realizing that um, that this was a problem that was suffered by everybody by all classes in American life and uh, and and therefore that it was something that the other lesson that they learned was that um, by sharing their experience with each other, they strengthened each other against um, the danger of of relapse. And um, of course, you know we we recognize how important that is today. But you know this was really a um, a revelation at the time. And and they when they went home, many of them 
um, joined the Keeley League, which was a which was a membership group that was open only to people who had been treated at the institutes and um, and for a few years at least they provided um, continuing support. Um, the the graduates of the program sent people back to sent new newcomers to the institute and um, and they had a going concern for you know for almost ten years. Um, and it actually, the last Keeley Clinic didn't close until the 1960s. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, um, so there were, you know, there were a lot of important lessons learned there um, that, uh, again, unfortunately, were, you know, were lost um, after uh, Prohibition. Prohibition is a great dark curtain drawn across all the, uh, you know, all the um, productive and, and yeah. progressive ideas that had you know come forward in the you know in the 19th century and it, it was in that sense that you know bill and bob um were building from you know the wreckage of yeah uh you know of the recovery movement and and were largely unaware of it yeah and, you know had only they had only a, a very rough idea of, about the washingtonians there was no history of the washingtonians isn't it interesting? I kind of had that feeling too as I was reading the book. It was almost like the like that prohibition era was like the dark ages that uh, that erased all of that history, all of that progressive action that was taking place prior to the um, to prohibition. Yeah, there you know there were actually there was a a um, the first there was an association for um, the cure of inebriates that was made up of doctors and asylum keepers. It started the first scientific journal on alcoholism that um, shut down in, uh, in just in the years before prohibition. So that when scientists went back to work um, in, the 19, in, in the 1940s to study the effects of alcohol, they had no idea that um, this earlier scientific work had done. So it really was a great you know blank spot um, after prohibition. Yeah. It's like, um, yeah, they we got a little bit a little bit judgmental, I guess, um, about about the problem, and that was like um, because now here and I found this interesting. We're getting into the the AA history now. I guess maybe we should start at the beginning. This is really fascinating stuff. But okay, so I know that uh, we know how the whole story started with with Roland um, visits uh, Dr. Jung, and he learns about the Oxford Group. And then he helps out um, Ebby Thatcher, who I didn't uh, understand. I didn't even know the story that he was firing a rifle in public, and that's what his problem was. <laughs> that's yeah, that's what got him. That's what got him arrested. <laughs> so he, he was looking at prison. He was looking at prison time. Yeah, he was shot, he was shooting a shotgun at uh, pigeons that were roosting on his recent paint job of his house. And, oh. uh, <laughs> Okay, and so they they nabbed him. <laughs> okay. I didn't even know that story. So anyway, yeah. so anyway, so then he, so then that that's how Abby brings brings us to Bill, and um, so Bill gets involved eventually after going having his experience at Towns Hospital. He eventually gets involved with the Oxford Group, and um, this was a this was a uh, this was an interesting history. Um, why don't you talk about it a little bit? Can you kind of go through that early history of Alcoholics Anonymous for us? Well, and how uh, it came from the Oxford Group? Yeah, I mean, the Oxford Group was this um, this evangelical Protestant uh, group that was formed um, with the with the goal of really saving the world, and um, it was going to do that by you know attracting people of high social class yeah. and uh, social esteem. And um, uh, and uh, but it had some core principles that were um, that would prove valuable to AA. It it it, it, um, it involved uh, you know taking inventory of uh, very close personal inventory of you know what you'd done right and wrong during the day and of um, uh, and of admitting that publicly. Um, or admitting it to another person, at least, and in some cases, admitting it um, during group meetings. Um, so, in many ways, it was it was very it was very Protestant. And um, but they the one big advantage that they had for the history of uh, for of alcoholics is that they were open to trying to help alcoholics. And um, whereas a lot of religions, again, continued to continued to um, reject them. Mm -hmm. And um, and it was there that, you know, uh, that both uh, uh, Bill and Bob uh, 
you know, found their initial home. Although Bob never got sober in um, in the Oxford group, he only got sober after after meeting Bill. But um, uh, but it had it it was extremely important for uh, the early development of uh, of the program. And you know, when when Bill sat down to write the twelve steps, the, some of the key concepts came from uh, from the Oxford group: the self examination, the acknowledgement. Um, of you know of uh, personal weakness and uh, and violations, but at, at a fairly early stage after the after Bill and Bob met, it began to become an anchor um, on AA, in part because there were people who wanted to um, to get sober who weren't Protestant and right. and who were um, and people who didn't believe in religion, and you know this first really became a problem in the Akron group. Um, as uh, one of the you know the early great promoters of of AA, Clarence, mm -hmm. um, a Clevelander, um, got sober, and started bringing Clevelanders to the Akron right. uh, Oxford group meetings. Some of whom were Catholics. Yeah, and, that one might reminded me of my old home group. They were like Irish Catholic, and that's that's what my home group was mainly. And so, but I what I found funny about that story was like when Clarence um, went to Bob about it. He said, "Well, that's, that's tough luck. They're just gonna have to re re leave their Catholic religion." <laughs> yeah, and um, and that would you know that would have severely limited you know the ability of AA to expand. Yeah, uh, and and there were also you know there there were um, there were lots of people who didn't believe in God and God. Mm. So religion was a real problem for AA from the beginning, and it's very important how they worked out the compromise that they did. Um, in, in writing the big book uh, that made it possible for uh, people of all religion and no religion um, to to come into into the program because there was a real struggle between people who wanted it to be a religious program um, and um, and people who thought that that would um, you know that would keep it from becoming important an important movement. Right. And and they reached a compromise. It was a compromise on both sides. I mean, it was on the one hand, God would be mentioned. Um, on the other hand, you know, uh, the higher power concept, you know, construed um, the idea of God much more broadly. And um, and there was, you know, there was the, the simple affirmation at the beginning of AA that, you know, that there was no required, there was no prerequisite prerequisite to membership mm -hmm. all you needed you know to belong was a desire to stop drinking yeah. period so yeah I, I i learned you know to respect the program even more deeply from you know from studying this early history i did too um and especially when you got into the um, area about when they were starting the general service conference and everything um but um i I'll, when, when we get back to the steps when bill was writing the steps it seemed like he was reluctant to really make any changes in the beginning. And all these people were arguing for this. And I was surprised, um, in your book I was reading, it was Hank Parkhurst that really seemed to have the most influence on him when he did make those changes. Although I know Jim Burwell, you mentioned, was also very much a force in arguing um, to against the God, the God stuff. But... Um, it, I guess it was was it kind of like a last minute decision on Bill's part to go ahead and make those changes at you know by adding God as you understood him and the twelve suggested steps. Yeah, I mean, I, I think he you know he changed his mind gradually. You know, originally, yeah, he didn't want to make any changes. It was almost like it was a God given. These were God given steps, right. <laughs> um, and um, and he really liked the he liked the way he wrote them up. So you know. Yeah. He, it was partly, um, you know, partly there was a certain amount of ego involved. Um, but I think, you know, they wore him down. You know, they Hank uh, was at him from the beginning and he was, you know, it was his scheme that actually helped produce the big book to begin with. So he was the, in there from the beginning and he constantly pressed against um, making, uh, you know, requiring um, people to believe in God. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think simultaneously the recognition that, you know, the problem that was developing in Cleveland of, um, uh, you know, of, of Catholics being unable to um, mm -hmm. possibly being excluded from the program, 
you know, all these things I think were working in his mind as he, um, uh, you know, as as the final touches were being put on the big book. And I and he was, you know, he was a great pragmatist. You know, he wanted to do, um, you know, what whatever it took to move the program forward. So, you know, so he attenuated a little his own, you know, his own deep um, spiritual, his, his own religious beliefs. Mm hmm. Yeah, and also I found it interesting that um, Clarence Snyder um, was such a vital um, player in our early history. I mean, uh, he probably had the first first true AA meeting or AA group. I mean, they were uh, up there in, in Cleveland when they were growing so much. And that, that happened because of the Catholic thing. He told Bob, he said, oh, no, I, I think that we can, we can do this with um, – you know, and keep these people in. And so he started all these meetings up. Yeah, no, it, um, I mean, he almost instantly proved his point because, um, once, you know, the first group was established in Cleveland and called and started calling itself Alcoholics Anonymous, um, it just exploded in Cleveland. And, um, almost overnight it went from one group to 50 groups. Um, and, um, you know, soon it was getting the national, getting national press attention, and it it established for the first time that um, this wasn't going to be just a small group of, um, you know, a small group helping a few people. It was going to be a group that, and as Bill said later, you know, involved the mass production of of uh, sobriety. Mm -hmm. So this, it was a key. It was a key change, and. Um, and when the Cleveland Plain Dealer started writing about it, um, um, even before the Saturday Evening Post article, you know, it, it said this is a program, uh, it's a spiritual program, but there are Protestants, there are Catholics, there are Jews, and there are people who, you know, worship nature. Right. And, you know, that was an essential, an essential thing to be able to, to say to people, you're not going to. You know, this is not a group that's going to try to change your mind about, you know, who you worship. Um, it's a group about sobriety alone. Yeah, for you to decide. Right. So they really did feel like they were they were being open to and, and inclusive. And I think that they probably were. I mean, for and especially for that time uh, period when you, you know, when you probably most people probably did identify as re, as religious, I, I assume. So anyway, during that time of explosive growth during the 1940s, this is when um, groups started doing some things like they were wanting to limit who would be members um, and, um, you know, and Bill was looking at, at some of these, these problems that were taking place. And I guess this is how he came up with, with the traditions, which um, I guess, so this is pretty early on in his history. He starts writing about the traditions. Did he start writing about them like during the 1940s? And then he, um, finalized them in the in 1951. Yeah, that's right. Okay, and um, then during that time, after after he wrote the those traditions, um, and that and now Bob is very ill with prostate cancer, and so Bill's thinking that we need to secure the future of Alcoholics Anonymous and give it to the fellowship, and at the time. His concern was that you had this alcoholics alcoholic foundation running things that that was mostly non-alcoholics, and um, he felt like um, he needed to give it give it to the fellowship. And I thought that was kind of an interesting history about how all of that service conference structure thing came about because it seems like Bob was a little bit hesitant about it at first, but it, but Bill was able to convince him to to let us go through with that, and even the the board the alcoholic anonymous the board uh, wasn't crazy about it can you talk a little bit about that maybe before we, we start? yeah i mean the reading about the early years you know of alcoholics anonymous it just it, it just makes you appreciate all the more um how much struggle has gone into it and, and um to allow us to be at the point where we are and how many false roads they walked down um and how many mistakes they made and um and how we nevertheless um, have the only, you know, the longest continuing recovery movement, you mm -hmm. know, history in history anywhere. And I, I think the bill who had his faults for sure, um, you know, um, saw that, you know, saw the future or thought about the future maybe a little more than um, Bob did. I mean, I think Bob, 
you know, was important uh, in the development of the program from the beginning to the last, and his insistence on keeping it simple, um, you know, is something that still guides us. But but Bill was worried about how that would actually work out um, as in organizational terms, mm-hmm. and you know, in, and believed that the you know the best way to to do that was to make it as democratic as possible, mm-hmm. and um, to to eliminate any danger that. Um, you know, that it might get hijacked or um, held back um, by any particular group of, of people and, um, and that alcoholics should be the leaders. But as you point out, it, his, biggest, his biggest critics um, for this plan, which just tore them, you know, um, and created great strife. We're alcoholic. We're the alcoholic members of the Alcoholic Foundation. Not, uh, no, not, really. Which, of course, I mean, what else? You know, what else would we expect, right? right? Drunks who made trouble, <laughs> and it wasn't the other guys. But, um, uh, but the the genius of Alcoholics Anonymous is is that you know it's a fellowship of, of very troublesome people who have potential to be very troublesome, but who have no choice but to be together because you know what else are we going to do to to protect ourselves and keep you know keep ourselves sober. Um, nothing is, nothing is more important than AA unity. Yeah. And, um, uh, and it is, you know, as Ernest Kurtz writes, it's, it's just, a, it's almost unprecedented in history that you have, uh, anything resembling, um, Alcoholics Anonymous. It's, uh, you yeah, know, I. It's like it's a, it, it is miraculous, even for those of us who don't believe in in miracles. <laughs> it is, and something that you wrote in the book, which I th- I think is very true, is it was Bill Wilson's leadership that that probably made the difference more than anything else. All those other movements, the Washingtonians and everything else that preceded that, they didn't have a Bill Wilson, you know. No, they had some. They had some great leaders. Yeah, um, but. Um, and it wasn't just Wilson. It was, you know, it was partly, you know, it was just the development over time of greater understanding about alcoholism and what was involved. Yeah. Um, and that um, that just getting sober wasn't enough. I mean, that was a mistake that that was made repeatedly um, during the recovery movement. There was this kind of a too optimistic view of alcoholism that that really once you got him sobered up they would stay sober and they wouldn't need anything else. Mm. You know, there was no need for a continuous uh, pro- co- uh, program of support for them. And so um, the number of, the number of people who got sober was really large. The number of me- people who stayed sober was comparatively small until AA came along. And, um, you know, there's simply no precedent for, any of these early organizations to, they couldn't even have conceived of millions of sober uh, alcoholics. Yeah. As I, as I was reading that, that, that chapter about AA and especially because of my involvement with it, I, I, I also, um, it kind of made me feel proud um, of, of Alcoholics Anonymous and what it's been able to do. And also just, just grateful for the whole service structure that is in place. I've been able to participate in that over the last couple of years. And reading that little history in your book just gave me more appreciation for what really went into making that what it is and how we do get to, you know, tell the trustees what we want them to do. They, they listen to us, you know, it's not the other way around. So it was kind of really, it was really nice to be able to read how all of this happened from the beginning of our history in the United States up until that point. Well, we're about coming out of time. Um, there's a lot more in the book, even past the Alcoholics Anonymous era. Um, it's really, it's really an, an amazing journey as you go through from the very beginning of this country's experience with alcohol up until now. Um, do you have any final thoughts that you want to impart upon us as we as we leave, uh, Chris? Anything else that yeah. you left out? That well, the biggest the biggest surprise to me. Um, uh, it was when I wrote the last chapter and I, and, um, which is really about the birth of the modern, uh, the modern recovery movement, um, in the, in the 21st century. And, you know, the, um, the coming together of alcoholics, um, with people who have drug problems mm-hmm. in recognition, of the fact that, you know, addiction, addiction is addiction. Yeah. And, um, that's such a, that's such a crucial, revelation and um 
you know, I think AA plays, you know, a really important part in that in that fight, but it, it is far broader at this point. And um, and how the you know tradition of anonymity is giving away to some extent in an effort to to spread the message even further. Um, we have a long way to go, but I'm you know I am very hopeful that based on our history we won't see the kind of retreats that there have been over history. You know um, there won't be another prohibition. There won't be you know there won't be a um, we'll never go back to thinking about alcoholism or any other addiction as just a personal failing or moral weakness. You know, what the recognition that it is a medical problem that needs treatment, um, you know, is going to help a lot, millions of people in the years ahead. So it's a, it's a very exciting time, even, even though, you know, it's also very tragic because of sure. the opioid epidemic. Yep. And I'm going to be speaking actually with a doctor and um, who works in Akron, and I believe she works in the same hospital that Dr. Bob worked in. Her name is Nicole Labor. And she, um, she is going to be talking about the science of addiction, the neurobiology of addiction. And her thesis is that addiction is addiction. It's not the drug. It's the, it's what happens in our brains. Um, and anyway, she, she wants, she talks from a public policy standpoint that it's important to look at the problem of addiction as, as, a, as a health issue of addiction and not necessarily as a specific drug that we need to target. So it'll be interesting talking to her about that too. So. Oh yeah. I look, I look forward to hearing that. Well, um, thank you, um, very, very much for agreeing to speak with me. I can't tell you anything I enjoy more than to read a good book. And then to have the opportunity to speak with the author, it, it's really a thrill for me to be able to do that. So thank you for taking time out of your day to uh, visit with me. Um, we'll be posting this um, podcast um, um, the week of your articles um, being posted on AA Beyond Belief. Okay, that'd be great. Well, All thank right. you. John. I really thank appreciate you. the opportunity to talk to you. Oh, very nice of you. Yeah, you have a nice day, Chris. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks for listening, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you have an idea for a podcast, uh, please send me an email or uh, if you'd like to be a guest on one of our episodes.